welcome to worship this morning. A couple quick announcements before we get started. Next Sunday, or the next worship service you watch, will be an important one for two reasons. First, it will be All Saints Sunday, a time in which we remember those who have passed away and are no longer with us in the previous year. It's an important time in our church calendar, and I'm excited for you to join with us. It will also be Communion Sunday. And as is our custom, if you can get some bread and some juice, whatever you have on hand, uh, ready for next week, we will be glad to take communion together. In any case, it is good to have you here in worship. It's good for you to join us. So may we prepare our hearts and our minds and enter into this time of singing, reading of scripture, praying, and talking about the one whom we serve. Would you join us now? We'll be singing, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, number 277 in the hymnal. We've read this passage before, but I want to read it again today from Isaiah 40. Do you not know, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired. His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary, and to him who lacks might, he increases power. Though youths grow weary and tired, and vigorous young men stumble badly, yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Let us pray. God, we confess to you a certain amount of weariness. And we confess to you that we don't look to you as often as we need to, as often as we should. We don't look to you for the strength to keep going. And God, so in this time of worship, we pray that this would be a time of looking to you, a time of listening to you, a time of acknowledging that you are our God and that you do provide strength to the weary. You keep us going. God, we pray that in our weariness that we would not neglect to look around 
and see that we have so much to be thankful for. So many blessings that go unnoticed. God, we thank you that we can gather together for worship, some in person, some outdoors, some over electronically or over the television. But God, we are thankful for that. We are thankful for the change of the seasons, for the beauty of the world you've given us. We're thankful that in this time of not being able to gather just as we would like that the work of the church continues, that we continue to meet needs in our community. We continue to give to the offering that will meet needs around our state. God, help us to look to you and be thankful. Thankful for all that you've given us. In your son's name we pray, amen.
When I was younger, I had a friend of mine who worked in the business of startups. He would try to start up new companies. He introduced me to an idea of an elevator pitch. He was saying that whatever company he was working on, he needed to condense down what they were trying to do in a short enough manner that if he was in one elevator ride with someone who might want to invest, he could pitch it to them. 30 seconds, he would say, try to do it. Now, it's pretty hard to do that sometimes, to condense down the complexity of all you might want to do. And, and I don't think an elevator pitch is exactly perfect for what we read in the text today, but it's a good point for us to maybe start thinking about this. Rather than having to condense something down due to time constraints, Jesus instead was asked to describe by the Pharisees what the greatest commandment was, or at least a great commandment. And he chooses to, in some ways, explain the basis for how he sees his teachings and the teachings inherited through the Old Testament. It's a rather bold idea, but one we can learn a lot from. Now, this, of course, comes from the 22nd chapter of Matthew. We've been working through the end of the book of Matthew. If you remember last week, we talked about a challenge that came from the Pharisees, but also the Herodians, that group who were allying with the powers at time, asked Jesus, is it lawful to pay taxes? In between that and this week, the Sadducees come and ask Jesus a question about the resurrection. That was something that they really did not buy into, and they try to trick Jesus there. In fact, this part of Matthew, scholars think, was Jesus standing in front of the temple being challenged by the various groups of his day. The Pharisees, seeing that the Sadducees had failed and the Herodians teaming up with them had failed, decide to go out and try something on their own. The Pharisees were a group that knew the law well. They applied it to a T. They even added things on. And so they asked Jesus, what do you think the greatest commandment is? Like all the others, they're trying to trap Jesus, and we'll get back to that. But it is rather profound that in this answer, Jesus goes big. He seeks to describe something that encompasses a lot of what he's trying to teach. Of course, it doesn't say all. There still is a lot more we need to understand of the nuance of Jesus' teaching. But it's a great place for us to start. And the first thing I think we need to know about this is this is an old answer that spoke for Jesus and keeps speaking for us. Because perhaps what we need to know, first of all, is that this was not a formation that was unique to Jesus. It, this is interesting that Jesus was not the first to put these two commandments together. It's the most famous, maybe, for many of us, but we have examples of different Jewish and rabbinical thought uh, up to this time, had placed these two together. The idea of loving God and the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. So this is not unique, but what's important is that for Jesus, he is pointing to this one way of thinking and saying, that is what I am trying to say. And in the context of Jesus' ministry, this is a powerful, powerful formation. If you might remember, earlier on in the book of Matthew, Jesus said, I came not to abolish the law, but instead to fulfill it. And this is how I believe Jesus understands that. On these two commandments, Jesus says, not only the law, the rules, the understanding of the Old Testament, but the prophets those beautiful texts that call us back into right relationship with God that we studied this summer, Jesus said both of these hang on these two commandments. Our understanding of what Jesus is teaching hangs on this. 
And that's an interesting picture. When I think of hanging on something, what probably first comes to my mind is, say, like a chandelier. All the beautiful aspects of a chandelier are nice, the little bits of glass, the lights that are a part of it, those are all important. But of course, the chandelier is hanging on the ceiling. If you tried to take out that central part that was there, that chandelier would fall to the ground. Maybe if we weren't looking at a chandelier, another way to describe it might be the root, the root through which every else thing grows forth. So maybe a mix of those two metaphors might be best. Because what Jesus is trying to say is that we are called to live out these laws of love, these commands. Love of God and love of our neighbor should be what guides our actions. The church, the followers of Jesus should be one of love. And this is important because so often when the church gets things wrong, it goes down the paths of hate. And that, Jesus would say, would be missing out on the very core of what he's teaching. But of course, the question we need to ask ourselves then is how do we define or talk about this idea of love? Love your Lord, your God, and love your neighbor as yourself. Love is so central to this understanding that we should talk about it. And, and it's something that we do struggle with, as been, has been noted by many, many before Love, in the English language, is a term that is very broad. I can love pizza, and that's a correct usage for it. We speak of love often in a romantic sense. We use a lot of elements of love. And one of the key moments that people, or key points that people will bring up, which is true about our understanding of what Jesus means by love, is that we would say here love is less meant to be a feeling, a kind of good disposition towards God and to others, but instead of action. Love is demonstrated. Love is shown through how we care for others. And, and I think that's a great way to be. I would also, though, like to add to it perhaps another element Another way to look at what the love Jesus is talking about here. Love in this passage is meant less to be the idea of affection. You know, a, an affection towards someone or something is often how we define love. But love in the Bible seems to be more about commitment. This idea of loving your neighbor as yourself comes from Leviticus 19. It is full of commandments that talk about loving and caring for others. And this love is shown by not bearing false witness, by practicing justice, by treating others fairly, by calling out wrongs when they are seen. This love is, in essence, a commitment to living in a caring community that looks out for each other. And if you think about this, this makes sense. Because our ultimate understanding of love comes from God and, and from Jesus. God's love of the nation of Israel is shown by his commitment, by his working with them, by his continually being with them even when they are disobedient and not following God. God is committed to them. And Jesus Christ is himself a sign of God's commitment to us, but Jesus also shows us that idea of commitment. That Jesus loves us so much that he lives, teaches us how to live, and ultimately dies for us. That love is one of commitment. And, and this is hard for us. I was thinking about this this week, how much of our popular media is really centered on this idea of love. 
course, we all know the share hit, What is Love? The Beatles said, All you need is love. Maybe didn't offer too much of a definition there. The famous short story writer Raymond Carter wrote the story, What do we talk about when we talk about love? I think these show in kind of a playful and and serious way, we are struggling to understand this more fully. And, And so how do we understand this? Maybe a good place to start, again, if we're sticking in pop culture, is a song from the musical Fiddler on the Roof, Do You Love Me? If you've seen this musical, it features a couple who have been married for a long time, and one of them, a couple, asks the husband to the wife, do you love me? And they go back and forth throughout the song, but the wife eventually responds in saying that for years she has been at her husband's side, she has raised children, she has cooked, she, they have shared so much together, and if that's not love, then what is? And while not the maybe perfect picture, I do think that's a beautiful place for us to start to think about this. Love is a commitment to take care of another. Or love is a commitment to God. Love is an action, of course, it is a living out of something deeply in our lives. And and what is this commitment? This commitment is a deep care for the flourishing of the other, or at least just a deep care and understanding of someone or God someone beyond us. We want love to be easy. Someone once said that we would all like to say we love our neighbor. Sure, I I love my neighbor. That's easy enough. I feel affection towards them. Even when they make me mad, I'm glad that they're there. But that general affection is kind of comes easy. I mean, sometimes we might not even have that. But the Bible challenges us to really think about what this love might look like. How might we commit to creating a better place for our neighbor? One that might cause us to have to give up something to make the world better for them. How do we commit to our neighbor and to God in a way that allows us to take a hard look at ourselves? To ask ourselves that hard question of where we might be falling short in love. Love of God and love of neighbor are not easy. Love, I think, is something that again, like that song, is something we learn. We learn by moving forward, by listening to the words of Jesus, by trying to live it out in the world, by experiencing God's love, and by showing that love to others. Because this is this revolutionary concept, I think, that Jesus is trying to state. He connects the love of God with the love of neighbors as we would love ourselves. This connection is rather important. Jesus is pulling two laws and putting them together. Now, I said again, this was a trick question, and people are trying to wonder what the Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus into. On a broad level, some people suggest maybe the Pharisees just wanted Jesus to pick one law and it would make people upset who thought there was another law that was more important. Now, that could be it, but I actually think some scholars hinted a bit more that on a more specific level... The Pharisees were hoping that Jesus would reply with the fact that we are to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. The Pharisees interpreted their strict adherence to the rules as a way of loving God. And so they would say to Jesus, why are you not agreeing with us? But Jesus says, yes, number one, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. That is number one. But number two, which is closely related, is that you should love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus joins these two together, and I think what he is trying to say is this. 
and on one level he's trying to say being religious in the sense that you could say, ah, I love God and I'm committed to the rules that God has given me and not caring about anyone else around you or the world around you, you'd say you're missing the point. No, it goes both ways. Love drives us vertically up to God and horizontally out to others all around us. Jesus sees these two as connected. You cannot love God and hate your neighbors, he is saying. And and what I think is also powerful is that each will in their right way teach us about the other. As we love God, we will learn what it means to love those around us. Because after all, God loves all of us. And to love God is to love also what God loves. But I also think there's that profound thing too that in loving our neighbors, we can learn to love God more. They are connected. It's this circle. You you should not separate these. Jesus says, of course, love of God is number one, but love of neighbor is close there. You cannot choose just one of these. When I got married, me and my wife chose, my wife and I chose to do traditional marriage vows, modified a little bit. But in those vows, we said, of course, to take each other in sickness and in health. Now, imagine if I had said at that time, well, I'll take you in health, but not sickness per se. You might say, well, you've kind of defeated a bit of the beauty of that saying. They they go together. The fact that you walk with someone in good and bad and sickness and health just makes sense. If you try to take one without the other, you're missing the point of what you're trying to say. God is again suggesting That love of God and love of Jesus is suggesting that the love of God and love of neighbor are two things that just go together. They will hopefully lead to one another. We are called to live a life of faith that strives to look out for those around us. To love God and to love those whom we come in contact with. And again, I know that this saying, to love God and love your neighbor, has been used a lot lately by quite a few churches. It can sometimes feel quaint, just saying it simply. But I really do think that the central message here is a powerful one. That we are to be a community that not only knows our love, the community is not only known for our love of God, And when people look at our church community, they say, wow, those are some people who really love their God. But also, we are to be known for our care, love, and commitment to those around us. A commitment that seeks the best for them, that wants them to succeed and have justice, that looks out for those. That, Jesus says, is what this all should be leading to. And it should be a reminder to us to always make sure that is the direction we are heading. A test. If we are ever falling short of this, we need to readjust. Interestingly, I think one assumption this passage makes is that you properly love yourself As someone said, if you love your neighbor like yourself and you don't like yourself that much, is that asking for too much? But I really think, as one commentator notes, that this passage assumes something. It assumes that we see ourselves in the way that God sees us. It assumes that we know that we are beloved children of God. The love of God should teach us to see ourselves and the way God sees us, as those who are loved and cared for. 
And so hopefully as we love our neighbors, we're not loving them just in that sense of self-preservation, which is good. It's the love of ourselves we should have, but also seeing that fellow belovedness of God. So, in one sense, be easy on yourself as you seek to learn what this means, how to truly love God and love our neighbors. It's a simple saying of Jesus, but one that I think can lead us to very beautiful and important places. Would you pray with me? God, this is a simple command of yours, but one that we can struggle living out. The law and the prophets hang on this, to love you and to love our neighbors as ourselves. God, teach us what love really is, that deep commitment that is something that sacrifice, that gives for others, something that seeks the best for those around us and seeks to be committed to you in what you call us to be. God, we love you. And we love those around us. Teach us, God, to live into that life of love more. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. We'll be singing, Yesu, Yesu, fill us with your love number 203 in the Glory to God hymnal. May I leave you with this good word. May your love of God grow every day. May your love of your neighbors grow too. Amen.